Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland in the parlor at Villa Louis in Prairie du Chien on the Mississippi River, an historic site run by the Wisconsin Historical Society. And uh, we have not just a historic setting for our University Place Presents today, but also a historic instrument that we'll be hearing generously. An 1879 Centennial Steinway Grand restored by Farley's House of Pianos, but it was in this very parlor for many years, beginning in 1885. And uh, performing on this piano, a combination of classical pieces and some Americana, is my guest for University Place Presents. Welcome to University Place Presents, Christopher Taylor. He is a professor of piano performance at the UW-Madison. Thank you. You're going to begin with the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, and this might be mm. called the uh, Mona Lisa of piano sonatas. Right. It's so, so famous, and perhaps in some ways, uh, mysteriously, what do you think explains this incredible popularity and familiarity with mm. the Moonlight Sonata? Well, I think the, the nickname has been a selling point in its favor. Uh, of course, the funny thing about this nickname is that it does not originate with Beethoven. In fact, only arose after his death. Uh, sometime in the 1830s, a poet named Rellstab said that he thought the first movement reminded him of the moonlight reflected on Lake Lucerne. Uh, so, and it's it's you know it's not a bad nickname all in all, I would say, and. Uh, uh, captures something of the evocative and mysterious atmosphere of the first movement, which is a very unusual thing. I mean, it was the first, really the first such sonata ever written that begins in this uh, very hushed and uh, subdued way, and then gradually as the, as the three movements progress, it becomes more and more agitated. Uh, so even in Beethoven's lifetime, before it had its nickname, it, it was... It was extremely popular, and in fact, uh, Beethoven uh, got a little annoyed about it, saying, uh, surely I've written better sonatas <laughs> than this. But uh, I'm not sure if he was right. It, it's, uh, it's a wonderful piece, despite its uh, overuse and abuse. The Moonlight Sonata on the 1879 Centennial Steinway Grand. Thank you. 
when uh, young Felix Mendelssohn played uh, part of Beethoven's fifth on the piano for the poet Goethe, Goethe said something to the effect of, wow, the ceiling must come down. <laughs> <laughs> and you get some idea from uh, your performance there as to uh, the uh, Olympian power that burst upon the world in 1801 right. with that sonata. Yes. We're going to go forward some 93 years and uh, hear a piece that actually could have been played on this uh, piano during the composer's lifetime. Right. Alexander Scriabin, Russian composer who was uh, influenced to a great extent, especially early on, by Frederick Chopin, who was writing back in the 1830s and 40s. When we hear these uh, six etudes by Scriabin, what do we hear that Chopin uh, wouldn't have given us? Um, well, the, as, as you indicated, they're, they're quite early works, and so the Chopin influence is extremely strong. But already we're, we're starting to see some hints of the later Scriabin, who was an extremely experimental and adventuresome composer, and who specialized in creating these uh, dreamy and ecstatic types of moods. Uh, so we see hints of that, and uh, you see some you know, quite massive sonorities in, in uh, these pieces. Uh, uh, tremendous amount of strength, for instance, coming from the left hand uh, that maybe is uh, moving beyond what Chopin did and a little closer perhaps to what Liszt had done in the previous generation. Uh, but it's, it's clear this is uh, a young composer who's going places and uh, despite the clearness of his influences, his, uh, his own musical personality is coming through pretty clearly. So we'll be hearing the Opus 8 Etudes, numbers 7 through 12, by Alexander Scriabin. Right. Thank you. 
six etudes, <laughs> opus eight, <laughs> number seven through 12, by clearly a very robust Alexander Scriabin, <laughs> and a very robust Christopher Taylor playing them on our 1879 Centennial Steinway here in the parlor of Villa Louie in Prairie de Sheen, Wisconsin. Now for some Americana. Right. We'll go forward not that many years, from 1894 to 1909 and then to 1915. Things were happening very quickly in the music world at that time, particularly in America. Right, right. So I'll be playing Two Rags um, by two of the uh, pioneers of that, of that particular genre, Scott Joplin, of course, and then his student, Joseph Lamb. So the Joplin rag I'm playing is the Wall Street rag, which is a somewhat whimsical sort of title. Uh, it's a very lyrical and beautiful rag. It also has a little whimsical headings at the uh, beginning of each of the four sections of the piece. Uh, so the first one is entitled Panic on Wall Street, Brokers <laughs> Feeling Melancholy. <laughs> uh, the second one, second section is Good Times Are Coming. And in the third section, good times have come. <laughs> and then in the final section, we, we hear that uh, listening to the strains of genuine ragtime, brokers forget their cares. <laughs> good uh, or bad times. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then the other, the second rag then is by J Joseph Lamb, written a few years later, the ragtime nightingale, which is uh, a particularly sophisticated and beautiful example of the type and uh, features a, uh, a run in the left hand at the beginning that appears to be a slowed down version of Chopin's revolutionary etude. So again, we hear Chopin's influence <laughs> right. in our Unavoidable. pieces. Unavoidable. Thank you.
Ragtime Nightingale by Mr. Lamb, and before that, Scott Joplin's Wall Street Rag. A good, a good pairing. Indeed. Well, as long as we're in the parlor of Louis, <laughs> the Dowsman home, we're going to end our concert with uh, something actually written by one of the family. I should add that uh, over Christopher Taylor's left shoulder, two of the Dowsman family members who have, uh, after a fashion, been attending our concert today, they are uh, Judith Dowsman Skidmore and her daughter Nina. They're the daughter and granddaughter, respectively, of Louis Dowsman and his wife Nina. And Louis being, of course, the uh, person for whom Villa Louis is named and the person who built it. But on the wall next to them is Virginia Dowsman, who was one of several people who wrote pieces of music about Villa Louis, wrote uh, songs celebrating this grand house. And uh, Virginia Dowsman wrote Villa Louis Beloved Home, which we'll hear now in an arrangement by Christopher Taylor. Love at Home by Virginia Dowson, played by Christopher Taylor. A great pleasure hearing you in this great hall, the parlor 
of Villa Louie in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. I'm Norman Gilliland. I hope you can join me next time around for University Place Presents. <laughs>